Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon session of Toronto Machine Learning Micro Summit in Finance. My name is Nadia, and I work at Nylas as a senior machine learning engineer. Today, I'm honored to be here and to have the opportunity to introduce one of our amazing speakers. Before starting, I would like to remind you that if you have a question, please post it in the chat. I will collect all the questions and ask them directly to our speaker after the presentation. Also, if you haven't already, please complete your profile so you can behave better when using the networking function. So our speaker is Avi Schwarzschild. Avi is a PhD student in the Applied Math and Scientific Computation program at the University of Maryland. He is advised by Dr. Tom Goldenstein on his work in AI security relating to data security and model vulnerability. Please join me in welcoming Avi Schwartzschild. Thank you very much um, for the introduction. Let me share my screen with everyone. Hi, good, uh, good afternoon, or I, I suppose we may not all be in the, time, in the same time zone. Um, today, my name is Avi Schwartzschild. Um, as mentioned, I'm a PhD student at the University of Maryland. I'm advised by Tom Goldstein and I study machine learning sort of at large. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about analyzing the security of machine learning for algorithmic trading. This is largely a summary of some findings that we wrote a paper on that's available in archive. My co-authors for this work were Micah Goldblum, who's currently a postdoc at the University of Maryland, Anki Patel, who's at Rice, and Tom Goldstein, um, my advisor. So um, this is a, a short talk on the vulnerability of machine learning systems that are used in algorithmic trading. Um, I'm gonna sort of break a technical talk rule here and not give you an outline because we're gonna make a few very concise points. Um, and so I'm gonna get into it right away. The, the important presence of machine learning and finance for this talk is high frequency trading systems. Um, specifically, the use of neural networks in these systems is of interest to us today in studying their uh, security vulnerability. And there have been several works um, talking about different applications of neural networks and different architectures in HFT systems. Security and reliability issues are particularly relevant to HFT systems. Um, they're relevant, I suppose, to lots of parts of finance, but with high frequency trading, actions are determined and executed in extremely short periods, making it impossible for human intervention to prevent deleterious behavior. So these, these models are trading, are, are doing valuation and prediction and, and trading signals and execution. All these things happen so quickly that we can't really oversee them until after they've done these actions and we can review them. Additionally, model behavior, particularly with neural networks, is often unstable and, and unstable in specifically hard to explain ways. Um, this, this begs the question, how can we better understand what's going on in these unstable behaviors. The part of the trading pipeline that we're going to study is valuation. So a particular trader may be interested in predicting the price or the price movement of a stock and then also determining when to buy and sell and then execution. All of these things have, have their own system. The valuation portion where we just have a function that looks at order book data and potentially other signals, although today the models I'll discuss use just the order book data. Um, they take those things as input and they're predicting the price movement. Um, I'm using the word price movement here and not price because the models we discussed don't output a dollar amount for the price. It's a classification setting and I'll get into details of how those classes work uh, on a slide in a few moments. Nonetheless, knowing whether a stock is going up or down is very important in any trading setting. So if you're using a neural network for valuation, you might be taking in the order book as data. I, I think probably most of the audience is familiar with the order book, so I'll sort of speed through this slide, but this table in gray and red at the top shows a, a sample of parts of the order book. The order book is a an aggregation of all the limit orders that have been placed. And a limit order consists of a volume or a number of shares to which to trade. And so if the stock moves above or below, depending on buy or sell, your trade will be executed. Your orders will be executed. Um, this is synthetic data. I made up these prices and shares in the table, but they serve to show some, some important things. The first is that 
shares are all integers and there's no requirement that they be distributed any particular way. You might have a lot of volume right at the center. That's at, that's at the spread. That's the best sell and the best buy price. You might have volume at the ends. The other thing here that's not typo but deliberate is the buy orders go from $4.02 to $4.03 to $4.05. There's no requirement that these things be at specific increments. If nobody has offered to buy this particular stock at $4.04, it doesn't show up in the book. The last thing that I want to point out in the gray and red table is that we have three levels out in each direction. So there are six columns here, and they are three price levels away from the best uh, from the best buy and sell price. In the models I'm going to show you that we've trained and, and probed, um, we're always taking in 10 levels out from both sides. So that would be a 20 column table and each of these cells has two, in, two numbers in it. Excuse me. Um, so a single snapshot of the order book at any given moment in time, the order book can be represented by 40 entries as far as we're concerned. That's price and size from 20 different levels. And additionally, we have to decide how much history is important. Um, so depending on the time scale, you might be looking at different things. In, in our case, we're looking at a minute of data with snapshots from every one hundredth of a second. So we're going to have 6,000 6, snapshots and 40 entries in our input signal. We can visualize this, which is actually really important for moving forward. So there's, there's kind of a lot going on here, although this graphic looks simple. The first thing I'd like to point out is that time is moving up the page. So the bottom of these red and yellow grids is time zero, and the top is one minute. One minute elapses as you go from bottom to top. The color bar all the way on the right that says size, I think you can see my mouse, um, is not correlated with time. This is rather just indicating with the colors, the darker, the black and the dark reds are lower size, so fewer shares are being offered at this price, and yellow and white indicates a lot of size. Um, these are the buy orders and the sell orders. The center is the spread or the best prices available, so we're moving out by going away from the middle. Each row, these, these images have 6,000 rows, so each row is really thin. Although you see this big block structure here, I'll address that in a moment, these tiny thin rows are actually a better indication of how thin a hundredth of a second is in representation as we move up the page. The blocks are important to notice because it looks almost like this whole row moved up and shifted, and that's indicative of some some activity, maybe all of the shares at a particular price were, were transacted, and so the price levels actually change. The dollar amount that these shares are being um, asked for is probably the same as this dollar. I mean, it is the same. I'm telling you, it's the same as this dollar amount. But now that's one level away from the spread because some new information has been presented to the order book. Um, and these long constant ribbons are indicative of very little activity. So the number of shares offered four price levels away or being asked for four price levels away just didn't change for most of this minute of data. Um, and again, it might be interesting to note that where there's light and where there are dark cells or columns, if you want to think about it that way, is actually not necessarily evenly distributed. It may not even be focused in the middle or the end. Um, okay. So this is another way to look at that same data, and this is really important to explain how we turn price prediction into a classification problem. So this is the size weighted average where we take each row in that previous image and we average it weighted by we average the prices weighted by their sizes. And the size weighted average is a univariate signal for almost the same data. Um, and this allows us to look at whether the price goes up or down. Looking at the order book alone, it's a little hard to, to determine up or down. You could talk about whether the spread moves, but but this is this actually has a lot more movement in it because if shares are being offered at a price that's different than they were a moment ago, the size weighted average will react, even if no transa transactions have happened. So that one minute of data is highlighted in green here. And we'll just say it's from, I don't know, maybe this is 80 seconds since the opening of this particular trading day up until 60 seconds later. This is one minute of data. And the green is the size weighted average 10 seconds after this snippet ends. And what we do is we're going to just bin that. If it's above a certain threshold marked here in gray, we call it going up. If it's in the red, it's going down. If it's in the gray, it's staying the same. And we picked these bands for each ticker and each month of data that we were looking at so that it's roughly even um, one third, one third, one third. That helps in terms of the learning the classification loss. Although 
that can be overcome and none of the adversarial stuff is lost uh, by, by using different bands for that. So our models, just to review one more time, are going to take input that's a sequence of order book snapshots and the output is movement prediction, up, down, or stay the same. So when we talk about an adversarial attack, and I'll give you a little more details about exactly what that means, but we're going to perturb inputs. That means a different sequence of order book snapshots. And we're gonna hope that the output is perturbed also. So a different classification in this three class problem, move up, move down, or stay the same. Okay, a little more about adversarial attacks before we talk about how they work in finance. Um, it's widely known in computer vision that image models, and for this example, I'll just mention classification models, are vulnerable to what we call adversarial attacks. This uh, perturbation that looks like noise here, although it isn't random, it's very important that that is a clever perturbation. It's found with an optimization process. It's added in such a small such a small amplitude that we actually can't tell the difference between these two images on the left and the right, the left most, the right most. But uh, uh, an image net prediction model will classify the left one correctly as a panda, and on the right it's incorrect with high confidence as a given. So these are um, these are known attributes of, of neural networks. They, they suffer from these vulnerabilities, and there's a lot of liter literature and computer vision about different attack strategies and defenses. The question we're gonna talk about today is can perturbing the order book have the same effect on trading systems? We wanna know if these neural networks that are doing price valuation are vulnerable to the same type of thing. Can very, very small, minute changes to the order book, such that the actual size weighted average doesn't move, can those affect these neural network models and fool them into misclassifying segments that they were previously classifying correctly? Um, the attacker's goals can then be formalized a little bit better, or at least drawn out. Uh, the attacker wishes to find orders to place that will fool the valuation model. So the attacker is not inserting data in this pipeline at any unrealistic stage. The attacker is an agent in the market, and as such, they can place orders to buy or sell at any price level. And in order to find a set of adversarial orders that accomplishes our goal, we need a differentiable trading simulation. And this is a one of the contributions of our paper that's that took a little bit of engineering. We need a way to come up with orders the adversary can place, figure out how they affect the order book downstream, because they will. If you place orders at a particular time, a few seconds later, they're still present in the order book, but where they show up in terms of which price level is dependent on how that order book looks. So we need to propagate these orders, and then we have to feed this into the model, find out its prediction, and in order to improve our adversarial orders at the beginning of this, we have to back propagate through all of that. And so we have a differentiable trading simulation to do this. The adversarial attack can be written out as a maximization problem. This is a fairly concise form of this. If you're interested in, in um, a little more notation and a little more definitions, um, the paper that I mentioned earlier that's available in archive has this written out in, in, in quite a longer form. But for the moment, consider the model as F, takes as input the order book, a, a series of order book snapshots, and it outputs a label Y. We have some loss function for classification that's going to be cross entropy, although this expression is written in general because adversarial attacks can be done on other systems. So we're looking for the maximum adversarial attack, which is a set of orders A, such that the, the sorry, we're looking over that set of A to maximize the loss of F of X plus delta comma Y. And here delta is that simulated sequence of order book, uh, of the simulated sequence of order book snapshots, sorry about that. that should, then that's a function of A. So there are some set of orders and delta is actually what the order book perturbation would look like. So we have to propagate those through time. Again, I just wanna make very clear here, these perturbations, what the adversary is doing is placing orders in the market, something that anybody with access can do. And so that's, that's important later on when we talk about um, how feasible these things are. <clears throat> Excuse me. So attack propagation, which I kept motioning with my hands, but th it looks like this. On the left, before the propagation, and this is all in the same axes that we were looking at with the order book, there are some orders here. And you'll notice that the, the size color bar here is a dramatically different scale than previously. White is one, black is zero. And there are colors in here, but we don't see any partial orders. So this is a constraint on the attacker that's worth mentioning now. The attacker can only place orders at price levels where orders have already been placed, because the attacker can't create, in our model, this is not necessarily a practical constraint, but the attacker 
can't create new price levels. And the attacker can only offer to trade, offered buy or sell shares in integer increments, which is a, that is a real constraint on the market. So the attacker is placing, placing orders here that are one share at a few different price levels. It looks like one, two, three, four different price levels. And there are actually many hundredths of a second in here, right? Remember these rows, there are 6,000 of them. So this is a whole lot of orders, but each order is for one share. And as we aggregate this in time, this is what it would look like. Now I mentioned before that propagation is actually a function of what an order book looks like. In this case, um, I'm not showing you the order book at the same time, but I will just let you know that the price levels didn't shift in this segment of time. And so we actually are able to basically take a cumulative sum forward al along these columns. That isn't always the case. If there had been activity here, if some trades had been executed at certain price levels shifted, we would know we have to determine how to shift that and all of that as part of our differentiable trading simulation. So this is the propagation. And this perturbation can actually just be superimposed. It can just be added to that order book that we were looking at before. Um, note the scale here is tiny. I'll remind you the scale on the whole order book. The bottom part of that was in the 10,000s and the top was 39,000 and change. So to add orders that are at most 736 shares at a particular place is pretty small relative to the book. So in, in the paper we go into talking about relative size and we can constrain the attacker to only place orders that, that are of a certain small relative size. Um, there are other constraints we could talk about, like whether the attacker has access to the number of shares they're trying to sell or the amount of cash that we need to buy these things. That's also discussed, and I don't want to spend too much time on that today, but um, sort of the, the punchline to all of those constraints, these are all reasonable. It doesn't take a ton of capital to do these things. The attacker can cancel these orders before 10 seconds in the future when we're actually measuring the labels, the size weighted average targets. Um, and so, so these are all very modest. They don't affect the size that much. They're a tiny percentage of the size on the books and they're reasonably um, attainable with a sort of modest account to begin with. And this is what the perturbed order book looked like. So remember that picture of the panda, we couldn't tell the difference. I might even argue it's harder to tell the difference here, although that comparison is, is not so important. But after we add that perturbation that I was just showing you, this this little thing that looks like a flame. We add that over here. You can't tell the difference because again, these are red things. There are more than 10,000 shares and we added at most 700 to any one of these rows. And furthermore, they don't affect the size weighted average later on. One by assumption, the attacker can choose to cancel the, the orders, but also they're so small that they're actually not moving the size weighted average. Meanwhile, this attack, which is just the same graphic from before, fooled a model into incorrectly predicting upward movement in the price. Um, I, I think that that's kind of remarkable. If you're familiar with adversarial attacks in computer vision, it might seem like, why not? Neural networks are sensitive. This is pretty cool though. This is a, a tiny little perturbation to the book. It doesn't change the target or the, or the ground truth as far as the size weighted average movement. And it does fool uh, a classifier that, that was trained to do pretty well. Um, the limitations of everything I just described to you of this whole process is that the attacker used knowledge of the future. The attacker used this propagation function. And so therefore the attacker knew the order book at the end of this one minute snippet and therefore could not have made the decision to place these orders in time at time zero here. And also, although I didn't make this abundantly clear until right now, the model predictor, sorry, the model that's doing the prediction that the attacker was back propagating through was known. That's the victim model. And we, we used that information to find these attacks. So these attacks don't necessarily provide an attacker with a feasible strategy to go into the marketplace and execute them. They are still phenomenally interesting in, in studying the vulnerability of these models. Even if we couldn't act on this strategy, someone else might have done something on this scale. And, and it's important to, to probe the models to find out where they're vulnerable and what types of activity they respond to. So you might conclude from this single example um, that, that small changes up in this left corner are a problem for your particular model, if, if that were the case. Um, I'm not gonna generalize for this particular model because this is just one sample, but that's, that's a use of these adversarial attacks where they are, where they are tailored to the model and use 
information about the future. More interestingly, in my opinion, although um, maybe I shouldn't say more interestingly, but but furthermore, we can we can relax these things. We could say, what if the attacker doesn't have knowledge of the future? And what if the attacker doesn't have knowledge of the victim's model parameters? Is there something that the attacker can do that does lead to a feasible, practical strategy that can be implemented in the marketplace? And we call this a transfer attack. We borrow that language again from, from computer vision, where perturbations computed using models that are different than the model you test this on, so we're transferring, um, can be can be applied in, in sort of a black box setting where you don't know your victim's model. The other thing, the other change here, besides using a different F than we expect the victim it will be using, is this big summation in the maximization problem. So we've actually changed the problem here. Now we're looking for a single A that maximizes the sum of all of these um, perturbations. So we, we pick one set of orders. This is an unpropagated set of orders, just a time a share and a number of shares and a price at which you can ask to buy or sell. And can some set of those maximize the loss on a whole range of input snippets? And without using future market data, without knowing the victim's model, we can still find this series of orders. So this, again, note this is unpropagated because the propagation is a function of the actual order book. And this is meant to be used on many different snapshots. So we didn't pick one and we didn't propagate it. But this is a set of orders that you could go and that, um, if memory serves, this was computed with Ford stock data. So you could go pick, um, place some orders for Ford at particular um, price levels. And again, these are done at price levels. It's agnostic of what the dollar amount is at this best buy and best sell order. And you could start at time zero and start placing the orders here and place them here, place them here. And you will actually hurt the model valuation models that someone else is using without knowing the architecture we looked at a variety of architectures, including multi-layer perceptrons, linear models, actually, which um, are also vulnerable to this to some degree, and LSTMs. And without knowing even the architecture or which time of day where you're going to place this, uh, you can still impair the ability of these models to perform. In fact, you can reduce them to below random, at which point uh, we would say you've, you've killed their performance. Um, so there is some feasible element here. This allows an attacker to enter the marketplace with a transfer attack, with a, what, what we call a universal transfer, transfer attack, since it's one perturbation for any time snippet. And we can still impair the ability of valuation models to predict the movement of the price. These are the papers that were referenced. Um, if you would like to know more about them, you can either take a screenshot right now or I can uh, make these slides available. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Abby. It was a really interesting uh, uh, point of view. I never thought about that. So we do have one question and I'm going to read it to you. Please post it in the chat any other question you might have. So does the adversarial attack here require access to the network parameters which it is uh, trying to attack? Uh, thank you. That's a great question. I assume that that question was given right before that last slide. Um, so yeah, there are attacks that we studied that do require that information. And those I would say are not practical. They're not something that somebody can take to the market and actually mess with their adversary. But um, we, we, did, we did study um, methods to find perturbations that are independent or agnostic, not independent, but agnostic of, the, of your victim's parameters. Okay, sounds good. So I don't see any other question. So we will take a couple of minutes. So maybe people can come up with other questions. I don't see any other question, but maybe I can ask okay. you a question. So yeah, uh, you sure. were saying at the beginning that uh, you are now more focusing on uh, computer vision. So here you're talking a lot about adversarial attack. So my question is, are you doing maybe some uh, interesting experiment on that field? Um, yeah, my, my work transitioned um, from this project actually into data poisoning, which is a form of an adversarial attack where you manipulate the training data, not the test time data. Oh. And so you hope that someone who trains on your perturbed version of the data will instill in their model some behavior that you can utilize at test time. So you might, you might change the training data so that someone who trains on it will, um, will come up with a model 
where for any image with a particular patch in the corner, it will always say that that image is a dog. And then you can fool that, that model into thinking your cat is a dog. Um, yeah, we studied that a lot, actually. There's, there's a lot of ongoing work in my research group about data poisoning and, and various attacks and defense strategies. Um, I see one more question, actually. Are there ML models that are less susceptible to adversarial attacks? So we did compare the susceptibility to attack across these, these different architectures. Um, and one trend we noticed is that LSTM models tend to be a little less vulnerable to attacks where you use the model parameters, but they're more vulnerable when you're doing this transfer style attack. Um, and, and there's some speculation around that. It's perhaps because LSTMs do some gradient masking, which is something other people have observed. Um, yeah, there's likely a, a range of susceptibility in, in models to these attacks. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Any other question? Don't be shy, people. OK, so it doesn't look like there are. Oh, yes. There is another question. Oh, that's a great question. Are LSTMs vulnerable because fake orders last only a short time? Um, I hadn't necessarily considered that that was the weakness of, of an LSTM, but I think that that's a very good point. And, and so I can't assertively say yes, but I, it seems like a reasonable guess. It would be interesting to study that. Um, maybe perhaps by making the, the input sequence shorter rather than taking in a minute, you might be able to probe to tease that out of the model. I don't know. Um, and there's one more question I see. Can you detect when the model is under attack? That's a really good question. And that's motivating future work in our group. Detecting these attacks is really difficult. Um, there is uh, There was a, an act passed by the United States Congress, the Dodd-Frank Act, I think in 2010, that was to prevent spoofing. So the idea that, that somebody might place orders with the intention to cancel them, hoping that it moves other people's perception of the market um, is illegal. Now, enforcing that is crazy hard because there are reasonable things that happen in the marketplace where you place an order and you do want to cancel it. Um, so detecting spoofing attacks, whether they're handcrafted or the, or the product of an optimization process like these adversarial attacks is really an open question. It's a very difficult one. and and um, there are some people in my group who are spending time on that right now. We, we, I don't have a good answer for you right now. We don't detect them well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So let's wait a few seconds just to give some time maybe to our last question. Yeah. I feel there is a lot to, to learn about adversarial attack. So it started everything only with picture, but now it's becoming a pretty big field. A lot of type of uh, neural network can be affected, and I didn't know anything about data poisoning. So that's also another topic coming up, apparently. So yeah, yeah. There was recently a, a news article about a Tesla going 85 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour speed limit zone because someone put a piece of black tape on this thing. And the idea is like there are perturbations you can make to the real world. The human driver who sees speed limit sign after speed limit sign, 35, 35, and then sees one that's like maybe says 85 is going to dismiss that. They're not going to start speeding up mm -hmm. to 80 miles an hour. Um, and, and the Tesla didn't. That's kind of an interesting non-optimization-based attack. But if we're going to have neural networks in the real world, whether they're trading you know, stocks and futures or uh, assessing people's ability to get loans or driving cars, it would be really good if we knew all the ways in which they might go wrong. Yeah, we should be get first good at uh, detecting attacks, and then maybe yeah. we can start to think about applying uh, those techniques, in my opinion. Okay, Absolutely. so thank you so much. We don't have any other questions, so we are going to close here. Thank you so much, okay. everyone, everyone, for attending, and thanks so much, Abby. Very interesting presentation. Thank you for having me. Bye.